refer to, to Ian uh, Lilly from ICANN and from the Faculty of Archaeology. Uh, please, uh, Ian. Thanks, everybody. And um, is it a kind of sort of number of pleasing, um, I don't know what you call them, I think of the word circularities in my career. The last time I saw Sonda face to face was in my PhD supervisor's lounge room in Australia 30 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so <That's right. laughs> it's, it's great to this see. Is sustainable. It's sustainable. And we have sustained a relationship. So, Absolutely. yeah. The other thing is that, that I'm finally in a NIAC meeting. Years ago, um, um, Willem just informed me basically that I was part of NIAC because I'm part of this and this is somehow connected to NIAC. So, I'm actually here now, and now I understand what it's all about. I'm not really here as an, uh, a, a representative of ICAM, but I, I feel I should say a few things about it. One, why aren't you all in it? <laughs> Two, membership is open to all archaeologists who are in ICAMOS, so think about it. But the other more serious thing is as we sit here talking today, Fritz, if he's been checking his email and I, are backing off messages from our president about the draft two guide of uh, draft version two guidelines for the management of archaeological heritage sites which Fritz and I and a bunch of other people were given the task of drafting in Florence a couple of weeks ago and we're we're trying to avoid having to finish it over the Christmas period but, but the president of ICOM is chasing us relentlessly so um, the point of raising this to you is that in the your discussions are being carried out in the context of a whole lot of other stuff that's going on around you, whether you know it or not. And some of it we communicate with you, some of it we don't communicate with very effectively, which is part of the problem. But before I actually get on to the, the guts of what I want to say, I'll just show you a few of those things, the sort of larger milieu in which you're operating and which I really think you have to take into account. For the streaming, do I have to stand in front of these droids or can I... Around that thing's not going to sort of take off and fall. Okay, so ICAM is here, and I do encourage you all to have a look at it and, and think about it if you can. Um, one thing that's come up on a number of occasions in which I'll come back to is our relationship with the nature conservation world. This is coming down the tracks at us like a great big locomotive, and we really need to be involved with it. I'm a commissioner of IUCN as well as a member of ICOMOS, one of very few people. This Conservation Congress happens every four years. There's another one that happens every 10 years, which clashed with the Florence ICOMOS um, meeting. Uh, I'm only going because it's in Hawaii. But um, <laughs> now, what we actually have a giant kind of program at this meeting and more generally linking ICOMOS and IUCN in which we're talking about a lot of the issues that we've been discussing here today sustainability, the role of culture in dealing with heritage broadly, the relationship between nature, cons nature conservation and um, uh, cultural heritage, involving organisations that most of you probably haven't had anything to deal, do with, not <coughs> just IUCN, which is the equivalent of ICOMOS in, in World Heritage but for Nature, but also the UN Development Program, the UN Environment Program, and all sorts of other people around the place. And part of this effort has seen, for example, uh, the president, or well, no, executive officer of uh, US ICOMOS, who's actually a lawyer, not an archaeologist, has been batting away very hard and has now got, um, he's appointed whatever the jargon word is, the point person um, for uh, cultural <coughs> heritage in the UN um, sustainable, what do they call it, sustainable development goals. Heritage wasn't in there in any shape or form. We, in general, not me specifically, have been fighting to have uh, culture included in there. It's now included, we now have a point person, but it hinges not just on people coming from ICOMOS and archeology span and, and cultural heritage, it, it really means joining up with these guys. Because apart from anything else, these people have an enormous amount of influence and an enormous amount of money. And that talks in, in the whole system. Also linked to that is working with them on things like this, the protected landscape approach, linking nature, culture and community. This is really very big in IUCN. And it really behooves all of us in cultural heritage to get with this program <coughs> in the American sense. In, as in, we need to know who these people are. She's also a member of ICOMOS. I think Nora might be. Mechthild Rossler, the new head of heritage for UNESCO, is kind of part of this mafia. 
we do need to be involved with this because this is the future coming at us. And it's about all the things we've been talking about in here, but it's actually probably a long way ahead in many respects. Okay, other aspects of this, of this thing, this is a program that I've been peripherally involved with, a program called Connecting Practice, which is specifically about bringing World Heritage Management of Culture and Nature together. We've had a pilot project. We're hoping to get some more funding for a, a longer term project. Um, but it's about, again, it's about dealing with these sorts of issues in a linked up or integrated way between IUCN or nature, conservation and cultural heritage. As I said, I'm just flicking through this stuff. Oh, there she is. I last had, saw her in um, Oman, I think it was. With, um, were you there, Fritz? Yeah, of course you were. Drinking gin and tonic down on the beach. Well, now she's the boss. She's a geographer from the German cultural landscapes tradition. She's also a member of ICOMOS and IUCN. She gets what we do. She understands what we do, but she really wants us to work coherently with IUCN. Okay. What's that? Oh, this is a Netherlands thing. I just thought I'd pop a couple of Netherlands things in that are happening in this direction. I was talking to, I can't see his name on there, Tom Bloomers yesterday. Um, he was quite intrigued to find out why Willem Willems had nominated me as his chosen successor, and I, was, I didn't quite know how to respond. Um, I bought Willem a lot of beers over the years. That's what it is. But this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. It is actually happening. It's happening here in the Netherlands now, but not a lot of us are taking enough, uh, make, giving it enough attention. Similarly, Jan Collins work in the background, <coughs> another kind of avenue in this sort of thing. Okay, but other things that join all this stuff up together and that are important, is important for us to know is that while we're talking about World Heritage here and thus UNESCO and its framework, <laughs> UNESCO is in a whole lot of ways closely linked to other global institutions like the so-called Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank and the IFC. They all refer to each other in their safeguards and their guidelines and so on. At the moment these guys are having a major review of what they call their safeguard policies, which include cultural heritage. The World Bank funds World Heritage <laughs> nominations as a form of development. I've just got one of my spies out in Sri Lanka has just said the um, Asian Development Bank has just arrived in Sri Lanka to fund a World Heritage nomination for development. <coughs> we have to know what these guys are doing in our neck of the woods. They're having this review. Part of my sort of plan for world domination is to actually um, inject our professional archaeological opinion into this process. So I've talked with a lot of people. Unfortunately, EAA kind of fell between the cracks because uh, um, Fritz had retired and, and Philippa hadn't become the president, so I wasn't able to get EAA involved. But most of the other major professional organisations around the world, like SAA and so on, um, put in some version of a thing that I wrote uh, on this. Um, is the what's called institution for archaeologists in the UK put their own one in but getting engaged with these guys is actually part of the process that I'm going to talk about in a minute similarly I want to come back to that one similarly working with the likes of Rio Tito to produce things like this again Willem was involved I was the I don't know, I forget what I was called she was a student of mine back in the day she's now the queen of cultural heritage for Rio Tito um, we put this out using an international kind of advisory panel, including people, I think Sonia Atelier was on it, certainly Villain was on it. Um, this is global guidance for Rio Tinto. We'll hope other major mining companies uh, take this kind of thing up. But people like the World Bank also refer to this. These guys refer to the World Bank and to UNESCO. So you can't engage with one without, in fact, engaging with all the others, because otherwise we're going to be working in a world in which, or over which we have no influence at all. We're getting engaged with them, and all of them, it's a lot of work, means that there's some kind of coherence in the, the approaches of all these global institutions, coherence about things that we care about, that we're interested in. One final thing before I actually talk is this other thing that connects with a project that I'm doing in Australia, which I'll talk about in a minute, but this is a Swiss funded project. We're actually a bit surprised that we got it. We, we threw it in and then they gave us several hundred thousand uh, Swiss francs. I'm doing an Australian bit. Uh, we've got bits in Nepal and Vietnam and the Philippines. 
looking at this, which connects with some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about at the moment. Okay, so that's just a quick run through of some of the sorts of things that I'm engaged with to give you an idea of where I'm coming from. Because what I want to talk about are the two key things that have jumped out at me over the last few hours. One big one is the idea that we must design for change. That's what all of this stuff, in my mind at least, is about. It's just that Sonda's giving me a catchy title for it. I used to have my old military training. It was adapt and overcome. Same kind of thing. Okay. The two issues that have jumped out at me in thinking about this designing for change are the passivity that Ty talked about and issues of translation that one way or another have come up over the last little while. As you can see, I'm not one for passivity. I think we should engage on all fronts all the time to the absolute maximum because otherwise people will not listen to us. We will not be on the radar screen. No matter what we want and think, they won't care. And so it is not good to be passive. It's actually good to be very active. It doesn't mean being rude and nasty. It just means getting involved. It means inserting ourselves into situations where we might not otherwise have been. It means sitting on committees that we might not otherwise imagine we'd ever see ourselves sitting on. Landscape planning committees, for example. Engaging with the World Bank, for example. One thing that came up, I think Sonda, it was very interesting, Sonda had his uh, paper on um, whatever it was, sustainability and so on, rejected. One of my little rants that uh, I go on with sometimes is how archaeology is left out of things, and archaeological heritage is left out of things all the time. And one good example was, um, I forget where I saw it, but in a discussion of the Anthropocene, which is a big thing at the moment, it's the, the, the sort of the geologists are trying to work out whether they should create an epoch um, recognising the period over which humans have had an impact on their environment. And they've got all kinds of people involved except archaeologists. What's the one profession that has something to say about the length of time people have had an impact on the global environment? What is the one profession that has evidence to talk to that problem? Why aren't we there? Why are we not there? Lynn Meskell, who, who's an old mate of mine, I should say, in relation to Australian connections, a lot of people don't know, Lynn is actually an Australian. So, um, she, her, her presence at um, um, Chatal, I think, is a big influence on how Ian Potter has been thinking about things over the while, because I do think there's an Australian perspective on this kind of thing that she helps bring to it. But she said, in relation to some other similar issue, why aren't archaeologists involved? Why, when a whole bunch of social scientists are sitting down with the UN or somebody else to talk about things like sustainability, to talk about things like development. Why aren't archaeologists at the table? And a lot of it, I think, is because, and I've said this before in other contexts, a lot of people have a cartoon idea of what we do. An Indiana Jones, Lara Croft kind of idea of what we do, which is obviously, except in my case, because I am Indiana Jones in disguise, but in most of your cases, is not true. Okay? We know that, but we have to work very hard to get over that. The other idea, though, that is more sophisticated, I think, is that, she said, they actually find the sorts of stuff that we deal with and talk about just too messy and hard. Dealing with what she called the messiness of things mm -hmm. is actually really, really hard for a lot of our colleagues outside archaeology, whether they're in the social sciences or the natural sciences or the hard sciences. The sort of stuff that we deal with and the way we deal with it is hard for people to get their heads around. So part of not being passive, part of engaging, to my mind, is actually working on the next problem that I'm going to very briefly talk about, which is translation, broadly speaking. I think we do a really bad job of translating what we do to other people. Not just cross-culturally, not just to people in a village in in Palestine or in somewhere in Kosovo or where I work in the highlands of New Guinea, for example. It's actually to our colleagues, people, well, in fact, in this faculty, to other archaeologists, but certainly to other social scientists, other people in the, in the, uh, the academy, people outside the academy, planners, politicians, lawyers, 
Because like it or not, they're the people that actually make the rules for the world that we live in. And if we're not at the table, but more importantly, as several people have said today, talking in language that they can understand, we won't get anywhere. It's no good us going in there and saying, speaking in archaeologies. They won't get it. We have to translate it into terms that they will understand. And an example I can use about this is, it's not a very nice one, but it's the, the way that... Um, <coughs> Um, what would we call it, a mediating language was thought up to create the atomic bomb. Project Manhattan brought together a whole lot of scientists from extremely different cultural, linguistic and more importantly professional scientific backgrounds. Often so, so different they had no words to talk to each other. Yet we all know that the project was successful. Nagasaki knows, Hiroshima knows. So what was it that they did that made it work? They, and there's some quite good studies on this, this specific example. They actually worked out this mediating language where they could all talk to each other. And that's one thing archaeologists, I think, have singularly failed to do, is actually translate what we do, not cross-culturally in the, in the normal sense of the term, cross-culturally inside our own systems. Also, of course, cross-culturally in the normal sense of the word. Well, I was talking to Sada before about this, and the same happens in New Guinea and all sorts of other places. Quite often there simply isn't a word for the words that we want to use in the language that we're talking in. And so we have to think not about literal translation, but conceptual translation. And in the, in the field of translation studies as an academic field, this is very well known. But there's a constant battle between translating the literal words. Like if you read the French and English versions of the World Heritage Commission, they don't say the same thing. And that's because the concepts for the French version are in fact just slightly, or sometimes a, a bit, different from the English concept. More complex. Well, absolutely. More nuanced. No, no, not at all. I'm just thinking I'd better not respond. Um, um, but more nuanced. But you imagine if we've, got that, if we've got that issue where ostensibly we come from the same deep cultural background, the same enlightenment background that we've been talking about. We can't even talk the same language there. What, what chance have we got on the Konyu Plain or in New Guinea or in wherever? Okay. So I think we have to think really, really, really hard about translation as a field, um, not just in the normal sense, but also in this larger sense that I'm talking about. Because if we don't, it doesn't matter how active we are, how non-passive we are, we're not actually going to make the impression that we want to make. Okay? We can jump up and down and make blockades, have manifestations, da, da, da. If we're not communicating effectively, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Okay? And one big thing, I'll finish now, that we need to understand in this whole thing is that what we're really up against is, again, broadly, broadly defined, is an issue of sovereignty. It's a problem or a hurdle or a... I don't know what you want to call it. But it's a, it's a, a blockage surround, or emanating from sovereignty. Sovereignty in terms of nation-states. We don't want you interfering in our, in our business. But it's also the sovereignty, if you like, or the autonomy or, or need for self-determination of non-state or sub-state actors. And I, who was it who was saying something before about, uh, well, it was Martin Janssen who's gone. As the World Heritage List expands, as we're encouraged to bring in all sorts of non-Western kinds of heritage with non-Western kinds of management, it's not just a matter of, of thinking, OK, well, I'll, I'll translate this and I can kind of get the concept, so I'll get that across. It's actually dealing with some incredibly sensitive political, political issues. In a lot of places, <coughs> Indigenous peoples, for example, or sub-state actors of most kinds are simply not recognised. The Indians, for example, just refuse to recognise that they have Indigenous populations. The Chinese, are, they call them different things. Okay? They're there, but they call them different things. If we blunder in and, and sort of start just talking as if we were I don't know, sitting in a boardroom in London or something, we're actually going to really offend everybody, put them offside, and not, not really make any headway. We actually have to understand that on the one hand, we are up against the sovereignty of the nation states, because World Heritage works around nation states. 
On the other, we're dealing with the sensitivities, the identity politics surrounding these um, minority populations. And they exist in Europe, of course, and it's not just people like the Sami. Well, I've spent enough time in rural France to know that there's very definite regional identities out there who are very sensitive to the, the what we would call it, their interactions with Paris, shall we say. Same in the UK. Okay. So these, the, our sensitivities to these other sub-national actors or non-national, non-state actors are also very important because we have to recognise that they, and it's an ethical, it's a Western ethical consideration respecting autonomy. Okay. We have to respect their right to self-determination, their right to speak for themselves. And that would bring me to the very last thing that I want to say in this, this, this talk, is that all of this stuff that we're talking about, about community interaction, I'm going to be a bit rude, <coughs> it, it, it's all incredibly Western and European. It's all kind of white folks turning up and saying, hi, I'm from Paris, I'm here to help. White Paris? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. You know what I mean. Okay. Certainly from, but what we're doing in this, the project that this is hanging off, is thinking, is thinking very carefully about this. I've worked, I don't actually work in an archaeology department, I haven't worked in an archaeology department for 20 something years. I've actually worked in an indigenous organisation within the university. And that's sort of sharpened my thinking on quite, quite a lot of things. Um, and one thing that's really clear to us is that us rolling up with the best of intention, rolling up to wherever it happens to be, rural Burgundy, New Guinea, the Konya Plain, and saying, hi, tell me this stuff in my terms, in my language, even if we've got perfect translation, is actually not the way to do it. Because people will, tr well, who was the, uh, with Philippa saying there will be this reaction thing, I go, what does he want to hear, hear me say in relation to this question? Is some government person coming how, do, how does one react to a government kind of thing? You actually, what we're doing, and it may not work perfectly, but what we're doing is actually going to communities on various World Heritage sites in Australia, particularly Indigenous communities, but not, not exclusively, and saying to them, okay, this is the thing that we're interested in. One, are you interested in, in working with us on this problem? Because there's no point in even starting if they go, well, actually, we don't care. Because all they'll do is, is reflect back to you what they think you want to hear. Okay? One, do you actually want to work with us on this project? Is it of importance to you? And we see this all the time in the university where researchers come to us and say, well, I've been out to Community X and, and I've got this really great project to stop. And it's something really horrible. I mean, child death or, you know, I can think of, you know, female genital mutilation and all of these sorts of horrible things. And I want to go and stop that or help them or introduce gender equality. And they don't want me to do it. What am I doing wrong? And they sort of said, well, did you actually ask them what their priorities were? Okay. It's not that they're not necessarily interested in those things. It's just that there's actually probably a whole bunch of other things that they've got on their plate that are far more important than what you're interested in. They may eventually get to it, but not right now. Okay. And there's a classic example in Australia where an, a white American anthropologist whose daughter is the ethnographer for one of the big... Silicon Valley companies, just as an aside, um, um, was shocked in, by the very high rate of um, domestic violence in Aboriginal communities. And she wrote, as we all up, she wrote with an Aboriginal woman um, a, a very pointed critique of this situation. And she was shocked when all the sort of senior Aboriginal Commentary, with female commentary, just jumped all over her. It's like, who the hell are you to come and tell us what to do? You, know, you white women are actually part of the colonial problem. And coming in and telling us this kind of stuff, regardless of whether it's true or not, is just actually a continuation of this. Everything's gone full circle. Most of those women are now really heavily involved in um, domestic violence programs. But at the time, it wasn't a priority. What the priority for them was was that male and female Indigenous people wanted to make a point about continuing repression by white and white women and men. Okay. So it took another ten years for it to get around to it, but they, they eventually came around. But just rolling in and saying, "Okay, well, I'm interested in whatever it happens to be," may not be on their 
list of priorities. The other thing is, once they have said, okay, yes, we're happy to talk to you about it, you actually say, what terms are you interested in talking to us uh, in? Rather than our terms from the academy, from you know, Harris or, or, or the headquarters, what language can we appropriately deal with this problem in? Because quite often the sorts of language that we use, even the locations we use, whether we sit in a house or a park or an office, can dramatically affect how the interaction proceeds and the results that you'll get out of it. So what we've effectively done, to cut a long story short, is take standard um, measures of, of uh, management effectiveness in, in World Heritage areas, which we've stolen from the natural sciences, one of her, the, the, the king of whom is, is on my research project. I made sure I got the IUCN god of performance management on my on my research team. Basically, he's there to do to find out how it works because they're as interested as we are in finding. Essentially, we're getting his instruments, which you can find on the World Heritage site, emptying them out of content and saying to the communities that we're dealing with, "Okay, you've agreed to work with us on this problem. How do you want to measure it? What language do you want to use? Where do you want to do it?" And by building that up before we start, we actually hope we get a much better outcome at the end. Rather than this, people just giving us answers they think we want to hear or not giving us answers at all. So to wrap this up, one, we don't want to stay passive. Two, we need to think about translation. But it's not just translating our language into somebody else's so that they understand what we mean. It's understanding what they mean by translating their terms into our terms. So it, I guess it's two-way translation. It's bottom-up, top-down translation so that we can be effective when we're being activists. That's probably all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you.